Order members, the sitting is resumed and we will commence with questions to the Minister of Employment and Learning and we will start with the listed questions. Questions number seven and nine have been withdrawn and I call Ms Claire Sugden. Uh, question number one. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the member for the question. Uh, the proposal to establish a veterinary school at the Coleraine campus of the University of Ulster has been brought forward by the university. The university has the discretion to offer veterinary courses from within its existing MASN allocation and funding. However, as the university wishes to secure funding from my department for its veterinary school, it is preparing an, e an economic appraisal to support its proposal. This pr the proposal may be used to, to bid for additional funding by my department. I call Ms Claire Sugden. Ah, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. And indeed, I encourage him to welcome the proposal when he does receive it. Northern Ireland does need a veterinary school, and Corian is indeed the best place forward. In line with his announcement today on apprenticeships, how does he envisage his department working with local veterinary practices to supplement a higher education veterinary course when it should come? Um, th thank the member for the, for the supplementary. And just by way of responding to some of, of the preliminary uh, comments, we will give a proper objective uh, analysis of the e economic appraisal whenever it does uh, come, f come forward. Uh, and um, indeed, the issue about whether Northern Ireland needs a veterinary school or, or otherwise will be one of the issues that we, we will wish to, uh, to take into, into consideration. And again, we have to weigh uh, the, uh, the expenditure on this against other objectives that we may have in terms of other skill requirements within our economy. And in terms of the comments she makes around uh, other aspects of this, um, I do, I do understand that uh, South West College, uh, it's, it's featured quite a lot today so far, uh, has been exploring some opportunities in, in relation to uh, some supporting issues around uh, animal welfare. Uh, and I, I do, I, I'm more than happy to ask the, the Director, Maliki McAleer, to get in touch with the member, uh, just to elaborate further in terms of some of those initiatives that are being undertaken in that regard. I call Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his indication that the he may see a need for a veterinary school in, in Northern Ireland because I think it's been well established even from presentations to the Employment and Learning Committee that all parties were supportive of that. The Minister refers to the economic I suppose, support from his department. Would he also consider there's a possibility of economic support from also enterprise trade and investment and agriculture and rural deve development because of the subject matter that is veterinary science? Uh, again, I thank the member uh, for the question. I think, again, by way of context, it's worth um, stressing uh, that an investment in terms of a veterinary school is actually very expensive. Um, the university themselves are talking of a school for about, about uh, 250 students, and that's uh, 50 across uh, five years. So we are talking around about a co total cost of about 78,000 uh, to train a vet, and that's probably more expensive than any other profession that you can think of. So it's important that members are conscious of that. The university, as things stand, can f go ahead with this from within its, uh, its existing resources, but that does mean a, a distortion. Um, so their preferred option is for the department to make a bid uh, for additional resources. Now, whether that's a bid from my department or whether it's something we do in, in conjunction uh, with Detty and Dard is something we can consider, uh, but it still has to be determined. I call John Dallet. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, listen carefully to the, the Minister's response. And I'm sure the Minister is familiar with the old adage, eat horse and you will get grass. Can the Minister assure us that Coleraine is not being fed on another empty promise and there's no money. Well, first of all, can I give the House of assurance that I have no intention of either eating horse or grass? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, obviously, the Coleraine campus is a major aspect of the University of Ulster. Uh, indeed, we've made some capital investments uh, in that university uh, in very, uh, very recent times. So there's an ongoing support there uh, to ensure that there, that there are uh, modern facilities. It is, of course, for the university themselves uh, to allocate courses around uh, their, their various uh, campuses. All I can say is to reiterate that I will give this a proper objective analysis, uh, but at this stage I can't give any commitments on what would be the way forward. I call Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and my apologies for being uh, a few moments late. Um, the, the, the Minister is uh, looking at the issue. Can he also establish whether the University of Ulster at their various campuses would be looking at various specialist schools that they could develop, hopefully a veterinary school at Coleraine and other campuses able to develop so that there is a holistic approach in a number of disciplines? 
Well, um, we're very happy to encourage the, the university to, to go down that uh, particular line, and uh, especially at postgraduate level, uh, that type of, of intervention where different types of institutes are set up, uh, and also where you corral um, people across a range of disciplinary boundaries uh, is a very important intervention that, that universities uh, can make. Again, the universities have their own uh, academic freedom. Uh, it is for them to make these calls. Uh, we do facilitate uh, the, direction, the broad direction of travel uh, through our higher education strategy, which does place the economy uh, at, at its core. And no doubt the, the Vice Chancellor and indeed his, his uh, successor uh, will um, wish to reflect upon the comments and encouragement the members made. Moving on, I call Paul Given. Question number two, Deputy Speaker. The Executive has not taken any decisions regarding reductions in departmental budgets in respect of delays in implementing welfare reform. I am aware that the Treasury is imposing penalties for the delays in implementing welfare reform locally. The Finance Minister has advised departments to plan for resource uh, baseline reduc reductions in 2014-15 and has advised departments that there may also be baseline reductions to cover welf welfare reform and other executive pressures in 2015-16. I call Paul Given. I thank the Minister for that response. Uh, is the Minister able to outline to the House what the uh, real impact of any reduction to his department would be for those vulnerable people who are in receipt uh, of different uh, benefits and support to get them into uh, training opportunities and into employment? And those are the people that we're trying to help, uh, those vulnerable people. And will there be implications then if your budget is reduced as a result of uh, not bringing forward the welfare reform? Um, well, I, I concur with the broad thrust of what the, what the member is saying, and let me frame the answer in, in, in this way. There are a range of different means by which we can help people who find themselves in poverty or lacking opportunities uh, to progress in, in, in society. Uh, it's important that we have a balance of interventions ac across the board. If we end up in a situation where we are essentially paying fines uh, to, to, to Westminster uh, for, for not implementing welfare reform, something it's, it's a decision out of our hands that we, under parity, have little choice uh, but to go, to go along with, then there are very real, very real implications for our ability to invest in those levers to help people to, to get out of poverty. Beyond my own department, I mean, we can look at things like investment, investing in public health, uh, which is important uh, to, to improving people's life chances. We can talk about investing in early years education, which is also important to investing in people's life chances. And from my own departmental perspective, investing in training programmes and unemployment schemes. Unless we actually can invest in the skills, the employability skills, the technical skills that enable people to engage with the labour market, then we actually are condemning people to a situation where they will uh, be on, in, in receipt of benefits. Too much of the current discussion is around simply the, the issue about the, the protection of benefits, worthy as that is. We have to have a much more rounded discussion and understand that we have a range of different mechanisms that are involved in supporting vulnerable people. And if we are forced into a situation where we have to make cutbacks to those, then we're actually inadvertently condemning people to a life of poverty and taking away the ladder that will actually allow them to escape from that. I call Pat Ramsey. Speaker, following on from Mr. Given. Could the Minister outline to the House the departmental reduction as a result of the Budget Bill and, and the effect it will have on him delivering the service that he has? Well, there's not actually a reduction as such in, in the Budget Bill uh, as is currently uh, working its way uh, through the House. Uh, the, the Budget Bill is, is uh, giving effect to the Budget that was uh, essentially agreed uh, by uh, the Executive and, and Assembly uh, for the, the, the entirety of the CSR period. But we all know that we're going through what a discussion that in some ways a little bit arbitrary and false because uh, we know this issue is still, is still looming. The issue is whether there will be uh, cuts made in year as part of the, the June monitoring round. That's where the discussions lie. It would be inappropriate for me to talk about the, the, the precise percentages and figures given that those are matters that are privy uh, within the executive at this stage and, and, and once those are agreed, no doubt the finance minister will make them known. But I think it's fair to say that across a whole range of departments uh, that some very difficult decisions will have to be taken on the back uh, of, of, of uh, the implications of the failure uh, of the executive and indeed the failure of the assembly uh, to, to find a common agreement on the way forward on welfare reform. I call Leslie Cree. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, uh, I'm sorry I didn't catch the Minister's response to the first question, but could you clarify perhaps that um, are any of his recent statements or programmes predicated upon the fact that welfare reform will be introduced? Well, uh, 
My department is not a, a, a welfare uh, department. That's the responsibility of the Department of, of Social uh, Development. Obviously, what happens in, in terms of welfare reform does influence the wider context in which uh, policy is, is made in Northern Ireland. Um, we, for example, are progressing uh, our new employment programme uh, steps uh, to success, and we hope to make announcements in that regard uh, in, in the very near future. That's something that we would have been addressing irrespective of welfare reform, because it, it is a refreshment of our existing uh, employment programme. But obviously, we will want to take into account uh, the onset of universal credit and other aspects of welfare reform in terms of how that will be implemented. Similarly, we have an emerging strategy at an executive level around um, economic uh, inactivity. Uh, that has its genesis outside of welfare reform because we understand that this is a deep structural problem within our economy that, that does need to be addressed. Indeed, we are the only part of the UK that is actually adopting an innovative approach to, to seeking to address that. Uh, but obviously, again, the, the, the crossover with, with that welfare reform will have an influence in terms of how we design the detail on that strategy and the way forward. Moving on, I call Jonathan Craig. Question number three, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, apprentices are employed through the current Apprenticeships NI programme. Uh, my department supports the, the cost of the off-the-job training required for achievement of qualifications set out in apprenticeship frameworks. Off-the-job training is delivered by further education colleges and other contracted training providers. In addition to training, an employer also receives a payment when the apprentice successfully completes the Apprenticeship NI programme. The incentive ranges from £250 to £1,500, depending on the complexity and level of apprenticeship undertaken. In January 2014, my department published its interim report on the review of apprenticeships, uh, and today we published the, the, the fresh uh, Northern Ireland strategy on apprenticeships. Uh, one of the proposals is the introduction of a central service to promote and support apprenticeship provision for employers and participants, which will advertise centrally apprenticeship vacancies and provide a matching service between employers and prospective apprentices. The central service will also signpost employers to approve providers of, of off-the-job training, including further education colleges. The central service will also provide advice and guidance for employers and potential apprentices on the range of support and training available. I call Jonathan Craig for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his uh, complete announcement to the House on the back of this question today. But uh, I'll also declare an interest in this, as my own son is one of four apprentices appointed to BT this year. Um, with regard to apprenticeships, would the Minister uh, agree with the concept of apprenticeships being a way for even government departments to ensure that they have certain expertise within it and have a minimum period of employment, such as is used by the armed forces? Because in some fields, like IT, government departments have great difficulty competing with the private sector. Uh, again, I, I thank the, the member uh, for his comments, and indeed uh, it was the, the, his question today that led us to ensure that we delivered the, the strategy uh, this, this morning. Uh, and obviously, we, we wish uh, your son every success in terms of, of his apprenticeship uh, with uh, BT, which is a, an excellent company with a great presence in, in, in Northern Ireland. In terms of the public sector, we already have um, a, a pilot um, private public ICT apprenticeship at level three. Uh, and that's, that's uh, in part um, working through NI, NI Direct. So that is uh, of benefit and working very, very successfully. One of the policy commitments in the new strategy is to uh, engage with the public sector around public sector uh, apprenticeships. Uh, we, I've written to my ministerial colleagues um, earlier on this year and received uh, a, a, a large number of favourable responses. Uh, we are doing some detailed works, work with different departments in relation to that. So there are, there's definitely scope for um, some uh, pilots in terms of professional technical uh, aspects uh, of the, the public sector in Northern Ireland. And indeed, we hope to be making some announcements in this regard in the, in the very near future. I call Fra McCann. Uh, thank you, the, thank the Minister, for his, uh, his statement uh, tonight. But in, in, in Later, the statement of the House this morning on uh, the, the, the apprenticeships, uh, could the Minister say if uh, further education colleges can play an important role in uh, the creation of and promotion of apprenticeships within their own field? Well, we, 
view uh, the further education sector as being a, a key delivery partner uh, with respect uh, to uh, apprenticeships. Uh, we also have a, a number of private sector um, training providers as well that, that, that engage. But in particular, as we look to move the apprenticeship model up the skills ladder and offer a greater number of higher level apprenticeships, then the role of the further education colleges becomes uh, even more critical. We also have the situation where um, the further education will offer a very logical progression route for people who are on uh, apprentices, including uh, higher level apprenticeships. And in particular, I would highlight the opportunity of foundation, uh, foundation degrees. And again, uh, higher education and, and further education has, has been a, a theme that a number of members have wished uh, to stress uh, over uh, the, the, pa the past while, and that's something that we are uh, seeking, seeking to, to, to build upon. Uh, we're also um, developing a further, further education strategy. Um, FE Men's Business goes back to 2004. It does need to be refreshed. So the, the new policy context in terms of both apprenticeships and a revised offer in terms of youth training will be two key drivers that will uh, shape the future provision of further education. I know all of the principals of the six colleges are very enthusiastic about the way forward in terms of apprenticeships and are very keen to become involved and indeed to build upon their existing invo involvement. I call Mike Nesbitt. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, in his announcement this morning, the Minister talked of apprenticeships at level seven uh, and eight, which would be the equivalent of master's and doctorate level. Can I ask the minister uh, what uptake he anticipates at those levels and what resource and strategy he'll be deploying to secure the uptake? Well, today we, we, we're launching the, the high-level uh, policy framework uh, for uh, apprenticeships, and we're making a, a major switch from a situation where apprenticeships are primarily offered at, at level two and level three, with the dominance being at, le at level two. We have an, a fresh uh, youth training offer, which will address the level two issue uh, to, to be uh, published for consultation in the autumn. And our new model of apprenticeships will run from levels three to, 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 uh, le to level eight. It's, this is very much in the hands of the sector partnerships to develop uh, new apprenticeship uh, frameworks. Uh, so we're in the hands of the business community and employers and other organizations uh, to develop uh, the new apprenticeship frameworks. We have set out the guidelines and frameworks in which we will support uh, the, the decisions of those, uh, th those partnerships. Uh, already we are piloting um, apprenticeships at level four, and indeed we're, 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 uh, we're set to, to uh, uh, pilot apprenticeships at level five, so good progress has been made in that regard. Uh, it is possible, uh, and we've seen in other parts of the world apprenticeships being delivered uh, for the equivalent of, of higher level skills at level seven and eight, and we want to make sure that Northern Ireland is part of that, but it's very much in the hands of the business community to come forward with those relevant proposals, and my department will be more than happy to facilitate, facilitate them in that regard. Moving on, I call Jim Wells. Question number four, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, BE Aerospace has been an important contributor to the local economy in Kilkeel uh, since operations commenced there in 1993. It currently employs 800 people in that location. Its business is the manufacture of aircraft cabin interiors, uh, particularly seating, in which the company is an acknowledged world leader. Whilst BEA Aerospace has not sought any assistance from my department, any request for help or advice on skills development or recruitment issues will be welcome. My department has much to offer businesses through its wide range of programmes, for example, on management and leadership, apprenticeships and bridge to, bridge to employment on recruitment. Many of the, these include attractive financial support. Advisors from the department's skills solution service would be happy to meet with BEA Aerospace to provide further information if that would be helpful. I call Jim Wells. Uh, would the Minister uh, be aware that 40% of all the aircraft seats made in the world by value are made in Kilkeel? And as he jets off in his first class travels throughout the world, he undoubtedly will be sitting in one of those seats. But is he also aware, is he also aware that uh, there's a certain degree of uh, doubt about the future of the aircraft factory in Kilkeel, that the company have indicated that it's going to be, the company is going to be split in two? into a service division and, um, and a faction and division, a question, and will he, will he join with the Deputy Minister to do all that's possible to retain that employment within Kilkeel? <laughs> well, um, can I first of all say, in terms of not only saying that, um, uh, that we are a world leader in terms of the provision uh, of, of aircraft seating, uh, just to go off topic slightly and say that actually that the Northern Ireland cows are probably the most prized cows uh, in terms of, of providing the letter uh, for, for those seats. 
um, given that, that um, I, I actually had the pleasure of visiting with the, one of the main suppliers uh, of, of the, the, the leather in, in Scotland recently, and they were commenting on the fact that uh, our local cows in, in Northern Ireland, because we don't have the same degree of barbed wire as they have in Scotland, provide a far better superior quality uh, of product in terms of cow skin uh, to, to, uh, to make the seats. So we're, 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 we're world leading in, in more than one way in, in this regard. But I'm more than happy to give an assurance. I understand the concerns that the member has raised around this. Clearly, uh, BE Airspace are not just a major employer in Kilkeel, but they're also a major employer in Northern Ireland. Uh, it's something we do wish to retain here. Um, I appreciate people's unease about the, the announcements that have been made, and I'm more than happy to work in conjunction uh, with the, the Deputy Minister to, to ensure that we can keep this in Northern Ireland. And in particular, on the skills piece, we're more than happy to, to contribute on that side of the equation. I call Phil Flanagan to ask the question about BE Aerospace in Kilkeel. Last Kieran Corley, and I thank the Minister for his answer. The Minister will be aware that um, major engineering companies like BE Aerospace um, offer day opportunities for, for students across the North to come and, and sample what it's like to work um, in such an environment. So, can the, the Minister tell the House how his department supports such in initiatives um, involving schools, colleges, and major employers like BE Aerospace? Uh, well, obviously, um, the, the issue of engagement between companies and schools and colleges is something that cuts across both my department and the Department of Education. Um, it's something that, where there are examples of very good practice uh, already. Unfortunately, those are, are too few, few and far between. Um, the member will be aware that we have launched a, a joint review of careers policy between my department and the Department of Education. And indeed, the issue of, of placements, uh, how we can encourage uh, more engagement between schools and colleges and businesses so people can understand the opportunities that are out there for them and also the more we can encourage careers teachers and careers advisors to spend time in the industry as well to fully understand the opportunities that are out there are all key things that we wish to, to build upon and develop further. I call Colm Eastwood. Uh, question number five. Uh, members will be aware of additional capital funding available to the executive from the UK government under the, the Economic Pact to support specific shared housing and education projects. The McGee teaching, te teaching block bid was one of those put forward by my department and subsequently submitted by the Department of Finance and Personnel uh, to HN Treasury for consideration under this initiative. The McGee project was not agreed by HN Treasury for inclusion in the package of shared education and housing projects. Um, the Treasury felt that, that it did not meet the criteria of being a shared education project. I call Colin Eastwood. Disappointing to hear, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that another piece of uh, infrastructure for dairy has been uh, turned down by whoever has turned it down. Can the Minister recommit uh, to what was a commitment within the one plan that the First and Deputy First Minister came to launch in the city of Derry, recommit to the 9,400 students uh, for McGee by 2020, given the fact there is an ongoing uh, consultation into the business case around that. Uh, if that business case uh, says what we all think it will say, will the Minister recommit to that and work with his executive colleagues to bring that about? Well, let, let me say several things to, to, to the member. I mean, first of all, um, we we're not walking away from the, the, the capital bid in relation uh, to, to McGee. Uh, it didn't meet the particular criteria uh, of, around shared education uh, in terms of the Treasury, in terms of this particular uh, fu funding opportunity. Um, we, we, it's still premature in terms of the fo formal business case approval and indeed planning permission for a bid to, to be made during this financial year for any capital funds. Uh, but uh, I certainly do intend, uh, subject to the, all the various approvals being in place, uh, to make a bid at the er earliest opportunity uh, for the investment in the teaching block at, at, at McGee. We also have made uh, significant interventions in terms of meeting the, the one plan objectives and we have uh, 650 uh, places uh, delivered already in, in that regard. I have to say that whenever I assumed office uh, there was zero funding uh, available for any expansion of university places anywhere in, in Northern Ireland and through different means we have managed to secure the funding uh, to allow us to expand uh, th those university places. But I also have to say to, to, to the member, as much as I have an aspiration and share his aspiration uh, to see McGee uh, further de de developed, 
uh, for me to, at this stage to commit uh, to additional places at, at, at the university uh, would be folly because in, in doing that I have to, to baseline a commitment uh, for, for at least uh, three years and in practice once you actually announce these places you can't simply just turn the tap off afterwards. And until we sort out the current impasse around welfare reform and budget un uncertainty, um, we are in no position to be making any further announcements of, of expansion uh, of the university or indeed anything that requires a, a baseline commitment in, in, into the future. So we, do, we have to get past the current uh, discussions we are, we are having before any of these discussions can actually be advanced any further. I call Raymond McCartney. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for a very detailed answer. Can I welcome the fact that he is committed to the expansion of McGee, in particular in relation to the point raised by Mr Eastwood. What plans have you got to go back to British Treasury, to, to, if you like, to highlight the shared campus at McGee to ensure that we get the money for this uh, teaching block? Well, just on the specifics of the, of the shared education bids, uh, part of the, of the issue was um, there was uncertainty around the, around the criteria uh, for, for those. Uh, we took the decision to go ahead and pitch uh, for the, the McGee campus uh, and to, to, to see what happened in, in that regard. I think one of the, of the, the critical um, issues really is in terms of the added value that's going to come from, from the project, because as the member knows, both uh, Fred Education and, and Higher Education are already shared. So we, we needed to demonstrate how we, we were providing additional, additional value. Uh, so we didn't get that one ac across the line. Um, there may well be other opportunities from special capital uh, programmes to to, to bid again. Equally, there may well be another capital reallocation within the executive due to underspends in, in other areas that we could uh, take advantage of. And indeed, we can actually bid for mainstream funding uh, for, on a capital front as part of the next uh, CSR period. Uh, I'm open to looking, looking at all of those different options. There's no question in my mind that I am committed uh, to moving ahead, subject to the approvals of the economic appraisal of the, um, of, of the, of the McGee teaching block capital investment. So at the earliest, earliest opportunity when we can do that, uh, we will take advantage of whatever funds are available. Moving on, I call George Robinson. Uh, question six, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, my department is committed to widening access and promoting educational opportunities for all, all individuals across Northern Ireland. Uh, further education colleges offer a, a variety of courses throughout their main campuses and a network of approximately 500 community outreach centres. In 2013, uh, 2012-13, there were 130,000 part-time enrolments on regulated qualifications in the sector and 33,000 part-time enrolments for recreational courses. These figures include people attending night classes. This is therefore a, a significant area of college activity. A further education curriculum policy has been developed to ensure that colleges achieve an appropriate balance between provision that strengthens economic and workforce development, enhances social cohesion and advances the individual's skills and learning. My department sets the, the strategic direction for further education sector and individual colleges are responsible for designing a curriculum offer to meet the needs of learners and employers in their areas. This includes the, the delivery of night classes. Students who require financial assistance to meet the costs associated with learning and who are undertaking accredited courses leading to regulated qualifications at FE colleges, including night classes, can apply for help through, through further education awards and or college hardship funds. The amount of support available from both these sources for eligible students is means tested based on household income and is dependent upon individual, circ individual circumstances. Income-based concessionary fees are also available at each college. The Department has, has also supported the College's advertising and marketing working group to promote the full range of further education provision, including night classes, through their prospectuses, online promotions and links to NI Direct. I call George Robinson. <clears throat> Thank you. Could I ask the Minister, would the Minister agree that night classes can provide a cost-effective and valuable mechanism in gaining and updating qualifications, which can en enhance promotion and job security and high unemployment areas such as Luma Valley? Uh, yes, I agree with the member. And, I mean, the comment applies to Luma Valley, it applies right across uh, all of Northern Ireland. Um, we do stress the importance um, of, of lifelong learning. Um, we do stress the importance of people constantly investing in their skills. 
uh, we live in a, in a much more volatile economic situation and a much more, uh, more changeable labour market. And it is likely that people will be changing their jobs uh, more frequently than has been the case uh, in the past. So we, we, we do want to encourage people to keep their skills as fresh as possible and also to think about how they can, they can progress in terms of, of, of their skills. So the role of the FE colleges is absolutely vital uh, in that regard, whether we're talking about daytime activity or night classes. I call Patsy McLoone. I'm going to ask on Corlea. Um, just, I heard earlier the, the Minister's response in regard to people taking night classes and what funding might be available to them. Uh, could the Minister just advise if that funding applies to people, uh, I'm not specifically referring to means-tested benefits because you've already outlined that, but to others who may be in part-time work uh, and who may be in, in receipt of uh, the likes of working tax credits and other lower income uh, means of uh, support. I yeah, just want to be careful of giving um, an inaccurate answer to the member in, in this regard. Um, and I think it's best that we judge each situation on, on, on the case that's put, that's put forward to us. <clears throat> so if the member has any particular cases in mind, I'm happy to, to look at those in, in greater detail and see if there is any eligible support uh, available. But we need to look at, at, at the round of circumstances of, of an individual before we can give a definitive answer uh, to any particular uh, situation that arises. And that is the end to list of questions, and we now move on to topical questions. And I call Mike Nesbitt. Deputy Speaker, thank you. I could ask the Minister for an update on the sale of the property in College Square East, uh, owned by Belfast Met. Um, I, I would love to be in a position to, to give the member a fuller answer today, but um, that uh, transaction, uh, is, uh, while it is very well advanced, and while there may well be speculation in the media today, uh, that transaction has yet to be formally concluded. And until that point occurs, uh, the matter must remain a commercial in confidence, and it would be inappropriate for me uh, to comment any further on that. Suffice to say that once the transaction has been fully cleared, an announcement can be made. I call Mike Nesbitt. Well, I, I thank the Minister. I, I suspect we are we're into the area of technicalities. However, perhaps he could update the House on uh, where the money is raised by the sale uh, will be utilised. Well, obviously this is a, a, a capital uh, receipt uh, and it will be something to, to be uh, reinvested back in, in the FE estate and no doubt it has been already accounted for uh, in terms of uh, business cases that have gone through in particular in relation to uh, all the redevelopments that have occurred uh, in relation to the expansion of Belfast Metropolitan College. I call Rosalie McCorley. Um, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, uh, he made a statement this morning saying that uh, mechanisms would be put in place to widen uh, access to apprenticeships for people with uh, disabilities. I'm um, Could you expand on that, please? Yes. Um, grateful uh, for the member for the, for the question. Um, we are looking at issues around ex the expansion uh, of participation in uh, apprenticeships. That includes uh, a, a, an overall figure of people who uh, will take advantage of such opportunities. We also want to look at any particular uh, barriers that exist. And we have raised issues about the, the, some of the gender imbalances that, that exist already, and also highlighted the, the point about people with, with disabilities. Um, this will then be cross-referenced with work we're doing in terms of our disability employment service. We are developing a disability employment strategy, uh, which will be subject to public consultation uh, in the autumn. And the issue about access to apprenticeships and indeed other training schemes will be one aspect of, of that strategy. I call Rosalie McCartney. I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, Minister, can you uh, outline uh, how, what the timeline would be for when we can expect to see uh, significant changes for people with disabilities in, in regards to their access to apprenticeships? Well, I think the first thing to say is that today um, there should not really be any barriers to people participating uh, in apprenticeships with, if they have a, dis a disability. The point is that while people may have a range of disabilities, uh, many of those are not uh, work limiting uh, disabilities and where people do have a, a disability that does restrict their ability to engage with work, we do have, have a number of existing schemes that will allow for adaptions to be made uh, in that regard. Probably the, the main challenge we have is one of, of promotional work. Uh, 
first of all, to encourage people with, with disabilities to, to explore uh, new options, and also to encourage employers uh, to create uh, opportunities and not to see disability as being a, a barrier. Uh, obviously, people shouldn't be discriminated on the basis of, of disability anyway, uh, but uh, it's important that we address people's mindsets uh, in, in this area and ensure that everyone has the opportunity to engage in employment. And it's important we bring the full range of talents to bear uh, to, to make sure our economy grows to its maximum potential. I call Sydney Anderson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Minister, can I ask, in relation to those who have had the misfortune to be made redundant, to, to outline your department's strategic approach in helping with reskilling and retraining uh, to assist them back into employment? Well, um, Again, I'm grateful to the member for the question. First of all, we have the Department's uh, Redundancy Service, which is available to help uh, with people in terms of the immediate um, situation that, that they, they find themselves in. Indeed, that we uh, offer clinics in that regard whenever we come across major uh, redundancies. Uh, we work in partnership with, with a number of other uh, agencies to provide a rounded uh, set of services uh, to deal with the different um, complexities that people will, will find themselves having, having to deal with. In terms of the issue then of, of uh, re retraining, uh, we can offer a whole range of different programs uh, in, in that regard. Uh, and, indeed, whenever we come across some major redundancies, we may take some very particular interventions to, to capture a, 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 an entire cohort of people who, who require uh, retraining and look to see if we can put in, put in place some specific programs in that regard and that's something we did for example explore on the back of the uh, redundancies that were announced in terms of, of FG Wilson uh, back in uh, the autumn of 2012 and I'm glad to say since then um, Caterpillar uh, have been flourishing and indeed um, uh, they've expanded to new product lines and that's again a success of the, the outreach work of the executive in terms of, of getting more uh, in, inward investment. We also then have our, our general programs that are, that are available uh, and that includes things like apprenticeships um, where which, which can be uh, an all-age uh, intervention. They're not restricted to people uh, between the ages of 18 uh, and, uh, and 24. We also have the Bridge to Employment Scheme, uh, which is there to, to work with, with uh, employers who wish to avail of opportunities uh, to work with people who are uh, unemployed. And indeed, um, th there is the, the Mainstream Steps to Work programme, which is shortly being replaced uh, by Steps to Success, uh, which is there to help people who are long-term unemployed. I call Sydney Anderson. Uh, thank you. Uh and I thank the Minister for that response. And Minister, you have touched on the, the all-age aspect, but I'm sure you will accept that, there, that those who are age 40 and over and who have been made redundant, they can find it indeed more difficult uh, to find employment. But can you tell us what specific action you're actually taking to help with those in that age bracket? Well, again, I think the member is right to, to highlight that there is a particular problem um, with, with older workers in terms of re-engagement with, with the labour market. And we, in terms of our profile of unemployment, uh, we do have particular pressure points at either part of, of the age spectrum, first of all young people and also um, old, older workers. Um, Again, the, the Steps to Success programme uh, will be all age, and within that, um, the, the, the new contractors will be encouraged uh, to, to be flexible in terms of the approach that, that they, they make, and, and doing that to tailor responses to suit the, the needs of, 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 of workers. So uh, those people who have maybe uh, less uh, qualifications because they went through school and training at a different period in time uh, may expect to see different types of interventions than perhaps younger workers who have maybe the qualifications, but, but in turn who maybe lack the experience. So we can see a differentiation in that regard. I would also highlight the, the Step Ahead 50 Plus uh, initiative, uh, where we provide placements for uh, older workers in the community and voluntary sector, uh, and that has proved to be very successful and, and very popular. I call Kieran McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And along the same lines as Mr. Anderson, can the minister? Um, well, he would be aware that the Northern Ireland has always had a high, uh, unfortunately, high unemployment uh, figures. Could the minister tell us what his comments is on the latest unemployment figures released recently? Again, I mean, the issue of, of unemployment is something that's highly relevant uh, to us all, uh, and it, it, it is an ongoing matter of concern. We, we, we are pleased, however, that we are seeing a sustained fall uh, in unemployment. Uh, and indeed, the, the current claim account stands at uh, 55,500, uh, 6.3% of, of the workforce. Uh, that's down uh, 500 uh, from the previous month. And we've now seen the claimant count uh, decreasing uh, for 17 uh, consistent months. That's the most sustained fall in unemployment uh, since June uh, 1995. 
Uh, and in terms of the seasonally adjusted uh, unemployment rate, we're now at 6.9%. Uh, and again, uh, that's a, a decrease in terms of, of the previous uh, figure. Um, that said, we do appreciate that we are moving from what has been a, a, a very high figure in terms of unemployment. So there's a lot of work still to be done to bring uh, those figures down even further. And within that, we do have some particular problems around uh, youth unemployment and also long-term unemployment. And there are specific interventions that we have uh, to address both of those aspects. I call Kieran McCarthy for some minister for his answer and uh, for the positive uh, response he's given. But could he? Um, suggest maybe that there would be some uh, co cross cooperation between his department and the Department of Education given the announcement that was made this morning in relation to new bill will there be opportunities jointly performed by the two departments to see that um, see any opportunities that there would be for to get our employment figures further down well, obviously, we are very keen to promote social clauses uh, across uh, government. They are now uh, mainstreamed, uh, and indeed, uh, departments have the option of going further uh, in, in that regard. And I have no doubt that the Minister of Education um, will be very committed to ensuring that uh, social clauses are deployed to the maximum in terms of the, of the programmes that he has uh, taken forward. And indeed, all of my ministerial colleagues, uh, do, I do believe, share the, the same outlook in, in that regard. Um, there is a lot, lot we, that we can do to address uh, unemployment. We have the, the war in immediate interventions to address those people who find themselves in unemployment through, for example, the Youth Employment Scheme for Young People, Steps to Success and, and some of the other interventions that we have. But we also have to look at some of the structural issues that we have to address within our economy uh, to make sure that we uh, try to remove unemployment at source. Uh, and that involves things such as better career, career advice, which is why we're doing the review of careers. It also means uh, the promotion of vocational training, uh, including apprenticeships. And I have made reference to the fact that many other countries across Europe that have stronger footprints in terms of vocational training have much lower levels of unemployment, including youth unemployment. There's a clear lesson for us in that regard. And that's why we're putting such a focus upon the importance of vocational training as a means of not, not only supplying the right skills for our economy, but also reducing unemployment. I call Alden McGuinness. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, one of the most intractable problems in our economy is uh, economic inactivity, and it seems to be stubbornly ingrained within our society. An expert group has been set up as uh, part of the economic inactivity framework. Could I ask the minister? Uh, to outline the progress that has been made in relation to this. Yeah, I'm ha happy to do that. Um, I, I concur with the member. This is a, a deep uh, structural problem within our economy. Uh, it's been with us for at least uh, 30 years and has survived the ups and downs of the economic cycle. So it does point to the fact that it is a deeply embedded uh, problem. Uh, the member will know we uh, launched a, a joint uh, consultation. Um, it was uh, devised by my department uh, in conjunction with the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment uh, on behalf of the executive, and that also involves support from another, a number of other government departments. Um, so the cons that consultation has closed, uh, and we have published a summary of responses uh, to uh, that uh, consultation. Um, a, a paper is set to be brought to the Economic Subcommittee of the Executive uh, next week, uh, discussing the way forward in that regard. Uh, and shortly thereafter, um, the departments involved will, will uh, bring a report uh, to the Executive uh, with a view to finalising a strategy. And in many respects, then, the hard work begins of, of trying to, to tackle this issue, which is deeply embedded. Uh, and we are looking to a, a series of pilot programmes uh, and proposals coming forward, including from the community and voluntary sector, about innovative means that we can uh, experiment with to see how we can, we can address th this issue, particularly in relation to those people who are long-term sick or disabled, uh, and also those uh, with family commitments who have, ex have been excluded from the labour market as a consequence of those. I call the old uh, could, could I thank the Minister for his answer and, and, and welcome the work that's being done in relation to economic inactivity in that particular segment, but a, a subset of that are people who suffer from disability. Is there any one person, any expert uh, represented in the group that might uh, sh uh, advise the group in terms of dealing with the problems that beset people who have, suffer from disability? Well, the work has been advanced uh, by officials from my department and the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment, and indeed officials uh, from other uh, departments. Um, however, we have a, a wide-ranging uh, engagement uh, with, key, with key stakeholders. Uh, for example, uh, 
uh, Minister Foster, Minister McCausland uh, and myself met with a range of businesses and other, other organisations uh, last Tuesday to discuss aspects of the emerging strategy and indeed that there were people there uh, from uh, disability organisations at the table. We have also had a number of stakeholder engagement events and again uh, they heavily uh, featured organisations that work in the disability sector. Uh, we have a commitment to ongoing engagement with all of those stakeholders including the, the, the uh, disability sector so I, I have confidence that those voices will very much be at the table uh, and influential in shaping future policy. I call Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister update the House on steps which are being taken to increase retention rates among students undertaking further and higher education courses? Well, I, I am pleased to say to, to the member that we are seeing uh, improvements in terms of both attainment and retention levels across uh, the further education uh, sector. Uh, it is something that the colleges themselves uh, are, are driving, uh, but under the, the, strategic, the strategic direction uh, from uh, the department. And indeed, as we look to the development of a, of a, of a revised uh, further education strategy later this year, those issues around uh, retention and attainment will, will be core features of that discussion. I call Joanne Dobson. Can I thank the Minister for his answer? I was privileged to support pupils recently at Bambridge campus of the Southern Regional College who, as part of her public service course, undertook a charity skydive. Now, I'm not asking the Minister to take, undertake a charity skydive, but... Go on. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> well, maybe you should. <laughs> Can I ask what plans does the Minister have to look at best practice examples like this and roll it out across the other sectors? Uh, well, first of all, before I undertake any skydive, I would want a firm assurance that I would be provided with a parachute. Um, who knows? <laughs> and, um, but in terms of the, of the issue of, of best practice, yes, we're, we're very keen to ensure that best practice is, is applied across uh, the colleges. Uh, we have uh, Colleges NI, which is the, the umbrella organisation uh, for the sector, and in many ways they're the best place people to, to, to spread uh, the, the news of, of, of successful in, interventions. By the same token, I don't want all six colleges being exact mirror images of, of each other. We do want them to experiment, to innovate, uh, and to have their own specialisms on behalf of the economy uh, as a whole. So it's appropriate, appropriate that we find the right balance in that regard, but I have no doubt that uh, they will be keen to, to hear the lessons of what's happened in Banbridge. And that is the end to questions to the Minister for Employment and Learning.